episode of the ATC Office Hours. We're going to talk today about turf grass nutrition and especially about POA annua, annual bluegrass, and a, a little bit about MLSN and, and if that is applicable for POA annua. So I'm so glad you could join me today and uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you for people who don't know you and then you can tell us a little bit more about yourself. You are a sales leader for Genesis Turfgrass or Genesis Turf Supply. And I first heard about you when you were a graduate student at Penn State and you were doing a master's thesis that I read with great pleasure when it was finished in 2019, which is fairly recent. And it's called Potassium Fertilization and Stress Tolerance of Intensely Managed Creeping Bankgrass Putting Greens which was quite an interesting topic for me because you were looking at how potassium affected the bank grass or lack of potassium affected the bank grass under really stressful or tournament type conditions. So it's, um, why don't you, can you elaborate a little bit on, on that introduction? And then I will say why you are the guest today. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Micah. And uh, yep, you're right. I do work for Genesis Turfgrass. I am in the sales side. Uh, you know, Genesis, we are a chemical and fertilizer distributor based out of Pennsylvania, working with the surrounding states. Uh, I personally work with golf course superintendents and other turf managers in Pittsburgh, Washington, D.C., New Jersey, uh, the metropolitan New York area, along with some areas other in the Northeast. Um, before starting with Genesis, I was in graduate school, like you said, at Penn State uh, under the direction of Dr. Max Soschberg. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, at Oakmont Country Club uh, outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I got to be on staff for uh, the 2016 U.S. Open. Uh, I, I definitely want to men mention I'm definitely not an expert in POA annual fertilization. Uh, I do get to work with a lot of really good superintendents, though, who produce some incredible POA annual putting surfaces. Uh, so I've been lucky enough to learn a little bit from them and add that in with what I learned in graduate school and in my current role. Uh, and yeah, I think it led me to come up with some good questions that I initially asked you in email, which uh, should help us hopefully figure out a little bit more about POA, and, POA annual fertilization. That's right. I, I got an email and I saw it came from Ben Brace. And we've never met in person. I don't think we've corresponded. If, if we have, it was a brief uh, discussion. Uh, yep. So I, I got this email and I saw in the, the subject line was about MLSN and POA annua, and it was from you. And I'm like, wow, cool. What a cool person to get an email from about this topic. And I read it and it had a number of interesting questions. This was a few weeks ago. and. Um, so I, I wrote back and I said, look, I'll try to answer it, but it's such, there's such interesting questions. Would you consider joining me on an office hours? Because this is the type of thing that I think a lot of people would be interested in um, about what the best way is to make sure that POA annua is supplied with all the nutrients that it can use and questioning whether MLSN is a good way to do that or maybe whether MLSN should be adjusted when we're working with POA annua. So let's see. How about the first question, which is, which is considering whether there might be a different nutrient requirement for bank grass and POA annua. And you mentioned this, that a lot of your customers are seeing good benefits. And I'm going to quote from your email. You said they're seeing good benefits from high levels of potassium, phosphorus, and calcium. And then I responded in the email, but I'd like to talk about this now. I responded, I said, let's not just say high levels, but let's talk about specific numbers because I'm not sure really how to talk about this unless we talk about exactly what high is or, or what's a high amount of fertilizer or what's a high amount in the soil. Can you, um, but can we discuss this a little bit? Yeah, uh, definitely. And yeah, that that's my main question. You know, I don't know if that was definitely written the best, the best way. Um, like you said, I think it, it is better to talk about certain levels. 
Uh, but, you know, just in general, you know, I think most guys that have poe annual putting greens, they do focus a little bit more on, um, especially P and K. Um, and I think the calcium is a lot through the Lyme applications. But, uh, you know, so I think that they're focusing more on that than bent grass, um, or at, at least some people. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily have specific numbers to talk, but uh, I think just in general, you know, a lot of people think, you know, I've had multiple people say it to me, oh, you know, phosphorus is good for Poa annua. Um, and then, you know, there's obviously been some work from Rutgers and other places documenting uh, a response from potassium at higher levels than what I saw and what you saw uh, than on bent grass. That's right. You know what we should do before we jump into the Poa too much? Uh, we we should we could also talk about your uh, your bent grass work for for your masters. But before that, um, I'm not seeing any comments showing up in the chat. But the the software is showing that there are some people live on the stream watching this. If if somebody watching this should be streaming on Facebook on YouTube. I think it's it's on Twitter also. Um, in the past, some of the comments will show up on. YouTube. So if somebody happens to be watching this, thank you. All right. So Eric Johnson says, good morning. Um, good morning. Good morning, Eric. He's out in uh, Western Washington, I believe, where they've had quite an exciting winter. So, all right. So the chat's working. That's awesome. Anybody that wants to chat or ask some questions or give experience uh, comments, tell us uh, what we're missing or, or what we should elaborate on, um, please, please feel free to do that. Um, right. Let's let's stick with Poa. I'm not going to I'm not going to go right back to bent grass. Um, but yeah, so the we could get into that later. Yeah. So it's definitely a concern because it I, I think anybody managing Poa w might be a little bit more afraid that it's going to die uh, compared with somebody managing bent grass it's like i i would think that poa annua has a greater chance to die and so if that's the case you want to be really careful that you're not uh, inciting any extra stress by withholding nutrients that could potentially help the grass um if, if that makes sense and so the research from Rutgers, which was, uh, Chad Schmidt did a lot of that, um, and they were applying different rates of potassium and they could find that they got more anthracnose when they applied low N and no potassium. And any increment of potassium that they added made the anthracnose um, less severe. And then they also noticed in one of the winters, they had some really striking winter kill damage in the plot that didn't have enough potassium. So again, any, any rate of potassium provided the protection against the winter kill. It, so that one off the top of my head uh, definitely showed a response to potassium for Poa. Yeah, I believe what? they also did find a, a quality benefit too um from poa annua I, I believe so i'm not 100 percent sure on that and uh I, in terms of the numbers i think they were 50 parts per million in the mat layer uh in terms of where they where they start to where they started to see more anthracnose and less turf quality yeah they were like 50 and then if you read all of the papers about it sometimes i think it goes down as low as 44 or something so the MLSN is 37, but that's down to 10 centimeters. And when they were sampling, they were omitting any of the material that was below the mat layer. So it's, it's not quite comparing apples to oranges, what the actual soil test levels are. But yeah, it, it seemed like maybe you need a little bit more. Yeah, and just, you know, a question. Well, what do you think those differences would be between the mat layer and then going down to the 10 centimeters like you mentioned? Well, if 
if they would have, I, I, I believe that that was on a sand based root zone, that particular yeah, I think it was. project. So if they would have gone down below the mat layer, it would have reduced their soil test concentration. So it may have been that they were growing that in in a in a soil that would test at 35 parts per million or, or 30 parts per million. And that's why I don't I don't want to get too into that particular number because I think that that number corresponds very well with the MLSN number based on the different way of, of sampling. And of course, potassium had an effect. And um, it's not it's not that the higher rates of potassium had a better effect. It was just that that little bit of potassium to correct a deficiency had an effect, which is which is awesome. I just um, I, I I think to me that doesn't say that MLSN is wrong because their numbers to me correspond very closely with MLSN. So, for example, uh, what's a typical potassium application rate? A tenth of a pound, two tenths of a pound, half a pound. Uh, you know, in in terms of just a general golf course, would you would you say? Yeah, like what? Am yeah, I, I would say you know a lot of people do spoon feeding, you know, throughout the year uh, at similar rates that you, those that you said, and then you know some people, and I know it's been a historical application, is doing those large granular uh, potassium maps around airification. So if we do spoon food feeding, it's going to be two tenths of a pound, maybe. Yeah, I would think a tenth to a two tenths, maybe a little bit less. You know, I think people will change it up as the year goes on. Okay, so a tenth of a pound. If you put a tenth of a pound, that is going to be like three parts per million. That's how mm -hmm. much it, it would change the soil. So if you were able to keep it off. Yeah, assuming it's distributed okay. through the top 10 centimeters and so on. If you yeah. uh, if you put two tenths of a pound, that's going to be about six or seven parts per million. And so when we start talking about what those actual numbers were in the Rutgers study compared to what MLSN is, if if we want to say that MLSN is 37 parts per million and they are uh, finding that they got a response where their critical level is 44 parts per million, to me, I'm looking at that going, that's a single application of two tenths of a pound of potassium. It's, yep. it's a to me, that's a negligible difference because I think definitely when I'm using MLSN and if I have bent grass or POA and if my soil test level is that low, I'm definitely gonna be recommending two tenths of a pound or more. And so to me, looking at the way that I actually use these, um, it's like, yeah, they definitely got a response to potassium, but it's not like it, it, it suggests that MLSN doesn't work to me. Yeah. And I, 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 I totally agree. And, you know, I don't, I didn't come on to, or ask those questions, I think to, to criticize MLSN, um, just more to kind of elaborate on, you know, okay, Poe annual might have a little bit more of a requirement as we've seen in some of these studies. And I think like you said, MLSN recommendation in that in that sense, I think that you'll have plenty of potassium in the in the in the soil and the tissue to not have to worry about that. But uh, more, I think about separating out the recommendation from what the critical level might be, uh, if that kind of makes sense. No, I I lost you. Oh, I, can you hear how me? How do we separate? separating the recommendation from the critical level what what uh, what do you mean by that i th i think you know in terms of that specific study that's where they found that they went downhill like you said we're going to recommend to be over that in almost every case i think any you know through mlsn i think any recommendation would do that um but i i just was speaking on more in terms of okay well this is this is more they were more looking for the critical than the recommendation um, so there, there, there are differences there. And I think that's what I'll see with some guys that, you know, with MLSN, you know, I, I do use MLSN personally in most cases. Uh, I'm not most of my customer soil nutrient consultants, but, you know, I do, I, I, I do a lot of educational resources. You know, my goal is to provide 
my customers with the best information possible uh, to help them make their decisions. Um, so that's kind of why, why, why I asked the questions in the email originally. And I think, yeah, there's some, some obviously some work showing some more of the critical stuff. It's, it's different than what the MLSN recommendation would be. Yes, we would be over that. But I think some people, at least when they hear minimum level, they think of the actual minimal level, which would be the critical level, not, not, not what it actually is, which is still a, a well overestimate of what the critical level would be. Yeah, we we hope and yes. and and uh, that's the goal, <laughs> right? That's the goal. And something I really like about MLSN, and we're going to get to some of these comments in the chat uh, very soon. But we'll just finish talking about this one first. Um, so the cool thing about MLSN is it's an active pro project. So you can you can contact me or contact Larry Stoll from Pace Turf, and you can. Uh, you know, as we have time, we will give you an answer. Um, and we 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 analyze the data. We look at other research projects and see what type of numbers they are getting, and make sure that MLSN is still making sense. And it's a project where we are going to continue updating these guidelines. It, and um, MLSN is something that I call a modern method for turf grass soil test interpretation. Um, and it, it's something that uh, we've published all the data. We've uh, published the code that we use to calculate the um, the, the guidelines, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a fun project. All right, I'm I'm so happy that people are here enjoying the chat. Let's see what what we have. Randy Berger says native soil pH 8.1, sodium 150 parts per million, manganese. Oh, right, okay, this is following up on his previous question. His previous question is, how to manage autumn seeded cool season grass in early spring using MLSN to promote fast spreading growth of Kentucky bluegrass and fine fescue? Awesome, are we, Randy, are we talking about a lawn here? Uh, or like a golf course fairway or rough sports field. If we're talking about autumn seeded in early spring to promote fast spreading, yeah, just hope for warm weather. I think there's uh, there's not a lot you can do. There's some cool research. Yeah, lawn, lawn. He says so. Um, you just want to make sure you have enough, but adding extra phosphorus in the springtime when the temperatures are, are cool, when the soil temperatures are cool, is not going to cause the grass to grow more. Um, and there's a, a cool research project that has been done in Scandinavia. And um, actually there was one, one location in China, uh, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, I think, Sweden, Norway, the Seussfoss project. And they tested growth in the springtime under cool temperatures, both from newly seeded. I, I think they, they use bent grass, but we would expect the same for any type of grass. And they didn't find, I mean, they found that temperature has the controlling effect. You, you can't add extra phosphorus and make it grow more. So I, I can share that in the description after I, after I finish this with some details. But I mean, to answer your question, how do you use MLSN? Uh, you use it just the same as, as you would in a normal, I mean, as, as any other case. And you have any tricks, Ben? No, I agree. Temperature, like you said, that's number one, I think. Um, it might be a good time to, to, to mention uh, some of the work from Rutgers uh, that I was mentioning that they presented at the, the crop science because that was looking at seeding um, bent grass, uh, you know, for for uh, reducing the amount of POA annuate that, that would come up. Uh, so, yeah, that work was done by Brandon McNally. Um, and like I said, yeah, it was presented at the crop side this year. I just, just happened to come across the video yesterday, I believe. But 
it was a greenhouse trial where they looked at the effect of phosphorus fertilization on a low phosphorus root zone at different soil pHs. Um, so in this, Brandon gave a, he did give a really good review of the current research on phosphorus and Poa annua. Most much of the studies he mentioned were from a long time ago, uh, you know, like 70s, 80s, 90s. There there were a couple recent ones though. Uh, the majority though, they found that when phosphorus was added to a low phosphorus soil. There was an increase in poa annual yield and vigor, which I think we would all expect, especially in a phosphorus depleted soil. Um, he noted that the critical level of this of phosphorus for poa annua is likely between 10 and 20 parts per million um, with the male of three extractant. Uh, but getting into more of their trial, so their starting level was only four parts per million, um, which I think we would all consider very low. Um, so what they did, they pulled poa annua seeds from the field uh, at their research center, and they seeded them in the pots along with creeping bank grass to observe their emer emergence. Uh, there was a high pH lime treatment uh, that had a pH of 7.1 at the end of the trial. The low pH treatment had a pH of 5.6 at the end of the trial. Um, so interesting for creeping bent grass, the lowest phosphorus rate at the lowest pH level was the top performer, meaning there's more creeping bent grass in the pot compared to poa annua. Uh, I think it was around 70%, I want to say. Uh, so in that same phosphorus rate at the high pH level had significantly less creeping bent grass, around 35%. Uh, um, now for poa annua, they found the opposite. Uh, the best performing treatment in terms of poa annua coverage was in the pots with the highest phosphorus fertilization rate at the highest pH level. Um, where the coverage was about 60%. Uh, the high phosphorus rate at the low pH level had significantly less POA annual coverage than the high phosphorus at the high pH. Um, so I think kind of getting on with his talk about seeding, um, this kind of kind of mentions, you know, the authors kind of note that if you are doing cre creeping bent grass, it's important to be careful with your phosphorus uh, when you're seeding, because it, according to them, and especially in a low phosphorus root zone, they saw uh, more annual poa annual infestation into the newly seeded areas, which were pots in this case. Uh, I will mention that the MLSN guideline for phosphorus is 21 parts per million at the yes, moment. It's much and, higher than four. And I often tell people who are managing creeping bank grass and who want to discourage poa annua from invading or possibly slow the invasion, I tell them to feel comfortable going below that, but I recommend having a phosphorus test plot somewhere where they do apply phosphorus because really what you're getting, I think, is a growth restriction. When, when you withhold phosphorus you tend to get a growth restriction before you see any discoloration, purpling, or um, drought stress type looking effects. You, what, what you get is, is a growth reduction and you tend not to notice that. And so yeah. it could be that you've got turf that's not recovering from traffic or it's just kind of thinning out because it's not, it's not growing fast enough. That, that's possibly something that could happen if the phosphorus is too low. And so I recommend just go ahead and blow right past the MLSN minimum if you have bank grass and you want to do that, but be aware that you're low, watch out for those type of symptoms and have a test plot to see if you get a benefit from adding phosphorus. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great, great recommendation. And yeah, I, I did have some experience doing some phosphorus work up at Penn State and very similar to what you said, you know, when you did get deficient, there was a growth. Uh, decline and then you know the the purpling and the the other uh, symptoms came up pretty quick. It, yeah, it's I've I've had some interesting experience growing warm season grass in pots, and it's shocking how much of a growth restriction happens when there's a phosphorus deficiency. And the leaves can look pretty normal, but it just completely stops growing. And uh, mm -hmm. it's 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 quite interesting. So I think you all you definitely get species differences. Okay, Eric had a comment. Eric Johnson says, 
anecdotal, but calcium and foliannua, he found that calcium applications triggered microdochium. Um, I think there might be a, a pH effect. I'm not, I'm not sure. That's definitely not my area of expertise. We need uh, Clint Maddox or John Dempsey or somebody to summarize that for us. But I'll take Eric's word for it. You can, I think we should be careful about applying too much. Sometimes applying too much can cause problems. And in fact, I think that's another one of the Rutgers things, uh, one yeah. of the Rutgers research. Didn't they apply potassium and increase dollar spot? But the abstract, I didn't, I didn't watch the presentation, but I read the abstract before the, the meeting and it said they were going to present the second year of research. Did you have a chance to find the second year of research and did they? Uh, yeah, I, that? I, I was able to watch the presentation. Let me see if I can pull up some info about it. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, yeah, according to here, what I wrote down, at least they, they did present both both years of research, which was 2020 and 2021. Um, and yeah, they did find uh, that potassium fertilization um, increased dollar spot on creeping bentgrass. Uh, and, and that was, they found that over both years. Um, I'm not, I did not write down what their soil levels were. I'm not sure if they presented that, but they, their rates were, which I hope you could do the conversion here. We're 3.4 3 kilogram potassium per hectare, 6.9 and 13.8. Um, but over two years, yeah, they, you know, there was no year effect there. So they did find that as potassium rate increased on creeping bank grass, they did see increases in dollar spot. Uh, they also tested it on POA annua. And in one year, um, they found more increases from increasing K rates than others in dollar spot. Uh, and so, I'm pretty sure they noted that was the, the, the high pressure dollar spot year. So potassium had a bad effect in all cases. Yes. Yeah. It, so it I'm, I'm looking at here. Worse. Yep. And I'm looking at here a screenshot that I pulled from there. And uh, yeah, yeah, even on the annual bluegrass. So, you know, when they went from the zero to the low rate, uh, there was an increase in both years. In 2020, once you hit that low rate, there was no no, no uh, negative effect of, a, of a, the higher rates. But in the 2021, which again, I'm, I didn't write it down, but I'm pretty sure I remember them noting that was the high. Uh, high dollar spot pressure a year um, when they went from the middle or from the low rate to the middle rates, they saw another increase and then it kind of tapered out. Wow. That, that, that is so unexpected because I think uh, for my career in the, I started working in this business in the 1990s. Uh, so I'm in my fourth, fourth decade of turf grass work now and being in my fourth decade of turf grass work i i always would have thought that adding potassium would help to make the grass healthier not increase its susceptibility to disease and that's uh let's see eric elaborated about the calcium nitrate he was saying what did he say oh um, oh right it, he was saying the normal thing to do used to be calcium nitrate to push growth in the winter. Back in the 1990s, in uh, maybe maybe Eric's been working in the business for five decades now, so he he remembers it all. So yeah, I think I think where we are now in 2022 is is uh, really trying to be very precise with applying just the right amount because we understand that. Applying too little can be a terrible problem and adding too much is a waste and can also cause increased disease in some cases or in the case of trying to favor one species over another, adding just a little bit of phosphorus can increase POA compared to bent grass. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's interesting that, you know, this, I mean, again, this was just a, it wasn't a large scale study, I don't believe, but there's been some other, I think you found some with high K rates, you guys saw some more snow mold. Was that correct? 
Oh, and some other did people. We ever, have. Did we ever? So there I mean, is some, you know, I think if most people would say, oh, well, you know, potassium, phosphorus are really not that expensive. Never want to even risk being too low. So, you know, let's just apply, you know, higher rates, higher than what we would need to. But I think it's more, you know, which I don't know if there's going to be more that comes out about it, but more negatives that you see with it. Um, that That just makes being more precise even more important. I agree. I agree. All right. Hello, Jason. Nice. Nice to see you guys from the West Coast can join us. Uh, hello, Joe. Welcome our friend from Delaware. Yeah, Randy, I'm, I mean, I think with average temperature in April of 22 Celsius to grow your lawn in faster. Um, oh, Oh, sorry, <laughs> 11 Celsius. No, yeah, it's not going to grow very much. You, uh, I was going to say, if, if, if your average temperature is up around 16, 17, 18 degrees for cool season grass, then you're going to see some nice rapid growth. It's going to fill in quickly. But I would just encourage you to be patient and uh, just make sure that you, you've supplied enough nutrients, but adding extra doesn't really do anything when the temperature is the limiting factor. If, if we think of, of turf grass growth is really affected by four things. It's, it's the nitrogen status of the leaves, it's the temperature, it's the amount of photosynthetic light, and it's the plant water status. So any of those can take growth back to zero. If you try to grow grass in the dark, it won't grow. If you try to grow grass with zero nitrogen, it won't grow. If you try to grow grass when the temperature is too hot or too cold, it won't grow and eventually you get to the point where it won't grow and i think that was all of them or water if it's too dry it won't grow and so in, in the case of springtime growth your the the limiting factor is temperature and you just have to wait for that limiting factor to to go away i mean if you want to do some hard work you can use tarps and cover it That'll heat, that'll heat it up a little bit, but if you're just one person taking care of a lawn, that's not a, a task that I would want to do. I'd rather cover with about six people. All right, so is this chat going off? Should we check out what, what these guys are talking about? Uh, so, Joe Galati was using bent and poa, or he was growing bent and poa. He thought MLSM was better, significant cost reduction. But he had problems on fairways. I think he said he had. Challenges managing fairways that were predominantly poa annua by implementing a low input approach with nutrients. And uh, I think, I mean, if you try to go low nitrogen, which I'm, I think that might have some problems. Yeah, I think um, actually this is, I was reading uh, Devin Carroll's paper last night uh, I went to graduate school with her actually, uh, and she did a, a, a big paper. I don't know if you got a chance to check it out on kind of all aspects of POA annua uh, management. And she didn't really mention anything about fertility, uh, which would have been perfect for this, but she did, I did pull a quote from there. It's very timely um, from Klein and a, a paper in 2001 reported that POA annua variability was higher in roughs and fairways than on putting greens, which received the most intense and consistent management. This phenomenon indicates that a gradient of selection pressure may exist across a golf course. So maybe there's some different biotypes or whatever we want to call it in the fairways that, that were affected by um, the lower nutritional levels than what your putting greens would have been. Yeah, except Joe elaborated and said the soil tests were oh. fine. Oh, okay. I, I, guess what, I guess what happens is you have worse irrigation coverage 
and you have annual bluegrass weevil and stuff like that. And so we're talking about definitely the turf quality is better on the grains, worse in the fairways, but it's probably not related to nutrients. Um, we, it sometimes it can be hard to separate cause and effect, or it's it's easy to think that there's cause and effect involved when there's not. Um, so I think with these nutrition things, we have to be careful about that. Yeah, and that's, that's definitely something I see, you know, where someone may be applying an excessive amount of potassium and they might think that they're seeing good results from that, but it could just be from a slew of other things that they're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Joe asks about keeping the POA alive on fairways in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and he asked, what are our thoughts? I, I think it's hard to keep POA annual alive in that part of the world. Um, and I think it's easier on greens because they're a small area. So you can, you can put products out more frequently that are gonna keep the grass protected from disease, protected from insects. Probably you have better irrigation coverage or you can hand water the dry spots better on the greens or you have a budget to put whiting agents and other things that are gonna help the water spread more effectively through the soil. So I, I think it's hard to keep that uh, pro annual alive on greens too and keep it at, at a really high putting quality. But I think it's easier on greens than it is on, on fairways if you have limited resources and the resources are allocated to greens and not to fairways. I don't know, Ben, you're, you're the local guy here. Tell me your Yeah, I, I think I would, would tend to agree with most of that. You definitely have more, you're doing more on the greens to keep everything alive. Um, but maybe there is some annual types in your fairways of Poe annua that isn't quite the same as a perennial in nature as what you have on your greens. Um, and they're just more susceptible to drought stress and, and other factors. You know, I, I don't know the answer to, to most of these questions. I think there's, there's a lot of, a lot of unknowns with Poe annua and, and differences where, okay, you're in Delaware, but maybe, uh, there's some differences from what you're working with and what you have in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, I'm just, just not 100% sure. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, it's interesting the research they're doing at Tennessee and they collect so much uh, plant material and they, they shared a photo uh, of some incredible roots. And, and I wondered if it was Poa annua roots because I always think of Poa annua being a, a shallow rooted species but one of the photos that was shared by somebody in the UT turfgrass program showed, you know, the, the roots that come down that deep. And I was thinking that if that's a POA plant, that's, that would be quite interesting to know that it can produce roots like that. Yeah, that would, that would be very interesting. I, I don't know. I don't know what time of year it was or anything like that, but, uh, Typically, you don't see that much root mass like you would in a creeping bank grass. And I think that, you know, that's one of the things that makes the two a lot different among many, many other things. It's, it's something that uh, Jason Haynes mentioned in the ATC Turf Discord chat, Discord server, um, where people discuss these kind of things. So if, if you like to use Discord, you can uh, you can find yeah, a link to the check that out. You can find a link to the ATC Turf Discord in my um, on the Asian Turfgrass website in the social media icons that go across the top, or in the About page. You can find it. So um, Jason mentioned that uh, in British Columbia, growing Poa annua, he's seen a response. He thinks to I think calcium and potassium during the hottest months of summer when the root system is damaged by the heat. So he's got a very shallow root system and he thinks that the soil levels are pretty close to MLSN, but grass just can't get enough. He speculates 
and he thinks that in that case, adding those elements might provide a benefit. And he mentioned a greening effect. Now, I'm sure he applied nitrogen with it. So again, we go back to the cause and effect because I'm like, somebody show me, somebody show me a greening effect from just adding straight potassium uh, or show me a greening effect from adding straight calcium with no nitrogen. Um, I, but I'm also going to like take his word for it that the grass was better after after he supplied calcium and potassium. But um, that certainly makes sense, doesn't it? That if you have shallower roots and if you have maybe increased plant demand because of the high temperatures, that maybe uh, the amount in the soil, which we would think should be enough, maybe sometimes it just isn't enough because the grass root system is damaged. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. And it kind of goes back to some of that Rutgers where, you know, I know they've only sa sampled the mat layer. Um, do you think that's a good strategy for Poania putting greens? Jason corrects me. He says it was uh, phosphorus and potassium. Oh, okay. okay, good. Um, so just sampling the mat layer. So by the mat layer, the if you if you grow grass on a sand based putting green, it develops organic matter and that mixes with the top dressing material. So you get a darker layer at the top. I think that's what they're calling their mat layer is the darker layer where you have some uh, rhizomes or stolons um, and a lot of roots mixed together. It's not really thatch, but it's it's uh, yeah, it's mat. It's I mean, I don't know exactly what the depth would have been in theirs, but I think they kind of just said, you know, where your turf roots are generally in the summer. And yeah, I think so what, and, and so they sample a different depth every year because their map layer changes every year, I presume. And it's, I would expect that the map layer just gets deeper and deeper. So you'd start off sampling very shallow and then, two years later, you might be sampling deeper. Um, I, I don't like it, but I might be wrong. But the reason why my first impression is to say I don't like doing it that way is I think now it's very difficult to compare to anywhere else in the world because now we've just sampled our turf in a very site-specific way that we now can't compare to anywhere else that's been, unless they happen to have the exact same depth of mat layer that we do. And that's why I like to sample to standard depths. And then, so we know what the depth is too, because if you just say mat layer, you're not even, if they would say that their mat layer was exactly six centimeters deep, and that's how deep they took the samples, we can convert it and try to estimate what it would be if it was at 10 centimeters or something. But if if you just say mat layer, and in fact, in Rutgers, they, they did mat layer and below the mat layer. I think they divided it in two. So they had two different numbers, um, which might make sense if you think you're really trying to study your soil. But I think for for research, maybe it works okay. Although I wish for research, they would do it at standard depths too. Um, but for turf grass managers, I definitely like to do it at uh, standard depths. I like four inches or 10 centimeters, but I think if I was managing POA and if my roots never, never, ever reached that depth, then I would consider a different standard depth like three inches or 7.5 centimeters or or less if, if necessary. But I just, the, the variable depth sampling just doesn't, I don't wanna sample it. If my mat layer is two inches deep this year and it's 2.1 inches deep the next year and 2.2 inches deep the, the year after that and constantly sampling to a different depth, I. I think it's difficult then to compare year after year also. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. I think there's definitely some, if your roots never do get past, let's say three inches, 
uh, I think I think that would be a good depth for you. But yeah, the mat layer, like you said, it's tough to relate to the field. And then if a course did that, I think it would be kind of tough to relate year to year. Um, also, of what you're, you know, if you're trying to compare your nutrient tests over years, um, there could be some issues there too. I've, I've got a question for you, and I don't know if you can share this kind of information, but you you work with some pretty high profile facilities that have poll annual greens and. You've worked on uh, golf courses in the past uh, as a crew member or intern or staff. Yep. Um, so, so I suppose you've you've looked at the root depth. What what is the root depth on on those really nice Poa annual old Poa annual greens that you get in that part of the world? Yeah, I mean, I think they could vary. Um, you know, they obviously vary with the time. In the summer, they're shorter. Uh, you know, I, I do work with. A bunch of courses that grow po annua in, diff in different parts um so definitely uh the, the the climate will play a role in kind of how the po annua performs over the course of the year i'll definitely see that and i mean that's definitely a big difference we see from bent grass where you know in the spring a lot of courses up here are ready to get going um and i think the po annua works really good for them because that pops up and, and starts moving right in the spring um, where I have some managers that, that take care of bent grass in those areas and, and they, they lag behind. Um, so, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know with, I don't know, I can't tell you an exact depth off the top of my head, but, you know, they're definitely short. You know, one superintendent told me that, you know, at his POA annual putting greens, he feels are pretty much dormant most of the time from like July 1 until Labor Day. Um, so, you know, I, I thought that was pretty interesting hearing that and, and seeing how that, that would affect his uh, fertilizer programs. And, you know, he says during, especially during that time, the most response that he'll get is from a soil mineralization or solubilization period, not a fertilizer app, obviously. It's, it's interesting. It, growing poa annua in the mid-Atlantic kind of reminds me of growing bank grass in Japan because growing bank grass in Japan, it's it's something like Augusta, Georgia, um, or even Jacksonville. So it's, mm. it's, it's like somewhere between Atlanta and Jacksonville in terms of temperatures. So as you get into the midsummer, all your roots are dying because it's, the soil temperatures are so hot and you have a situation where the grass is, you're just hoping it's gonna survive the summer. Uh, which which kind of reminds me about how you would fertilize bank grass and how you would manage bank grass during August, during July and August in Japan. Um, it's something similar to what you would do with Poa annua, I think, in in your region. Yeah, in the mid Atlantic, definitely, because it gets it can get super hot there, and and you know, like I have. A, there's some courses in uh, the Washington DC area that have Poa annua and then, you know, obviously a lot more north. So uh, the way that the year progresses, you know, that, that I would believe that what you would call a dormant window would just be wider and wider as you go south. Cool. You Let's move on to another question you asked in the email. Uh, you said, is spoon feeding more beneficial or, or could it be more beneficial on poa annua than on bent grass. What do you do? Do people I, think that? I think. That? I mean, I think it's best in. I, I think most people. Yeah, you know, I think most superintendents in this area at least are spoon feeding. Um, and yeah, I think it could definitely be beneficial um, compared to doing, you know, these large granular applications. I would be curious to see how much we're actually losing, and that was something that I found in my research work again it was on bent grass but we had a really wet year um two both of my years of study were actually pretty wet but the first year was very wet and we were applying potassium at rates up to six pounds per thousand i believe um and with all the rain you know and that was six pounds over the course of a year applied every single week so very intense spoon feeding program we weren't able we were losing the majority of our potassium you know even in our uh you know, more native soil greens, I guess you would say, you know, we weren't able to store, store all that we were applying. We were losing much of it. Um, so I think especially during a wet year, you know, 
that's when smooth feeding really is important because you're you're trying to apply as little light and frequently so the soil can hold as much as it can um in terms of poa and and bent you know i think kind of what what you gave me the answer of i think should be doing it on both of those i think it's the best strategy i think it's probably the easiest strategy especially you know in the northeast where you're going out with a spray every week every 10 days every 14 days so you know it's not that hard to just add a little bit of whatever nutrient you're trying to put in compared to you know let's say if you're doing a big granular app sending four or five guys out with push spreaders to do to do a, a big app and try to time it with the rain and everything and then you know again how much of that are you actually going to be able to, to utilize your plants be able to utilize do people still do that big granular apps i think some people will i mean it, it all depends on i think um you know what you're working with and then you know probably what what has worked for you for the last many years and I mean, I, I don't feel I ever have the position to tell tell a superintendent what to do. You know, again, my goal is to, hey, I'll give you the information um, to make your best decision. But, you know, you you know your course, you know your property better than anything else. Um, so it, it, it's not worth it. And I don't think there's a reason to kind of to argue with someone if, let's say, they are doing that, if they're see, if they believe they're seeing some sort of benefit. Um. I think adding fertilizer always gives some kind of benefit if, if it has mm -hmm. nitrogen in it. So uh, it's just, yeah, getting the right rate. I think it's difficult to apply the right rate um, on soils that don't hold a lot of nutrients with a yeah. granular app. Um, so, of course, yeah, when even I in, like I said, even when I was doing an intense spoon feeding program, it was tough to tough to bank that that K in in the soil or in the tissue, you know. Well, yeah, you, you probably saw rain. you probably saw Jackie Guevara's research at Michigan State, where she compared MLSN fertilization for P and K with uh, SLAN from the I think the Michigan State recommendations, and I forget if that was on two different soil types. I, I think it was one soil type that they had POA on some plots and fangrass on the other plots, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's just amazing for all the potassium applied it just disappears you you can't find yeah, it yeah they were the supposed to put study. down like nine pounds right or something like that yeah and then at the end of the year number. you put it down and your soil test level didn't go up and yeah that's that's what i i always used to say like soil test uh recommendations are broken or soil testing is broken i used to use that phrase a decade ago or something and and use it pretty frequently. And that's really what I meant is that if we keep trying to hit these levels in the soil with nutrients, when the soil can't hold that many nutrients, it's just ridiculous because you, you get these recommendations to say you need to apply like nine pounds of potassium, then you do it, and then you'll test again the next year and get the same recommendation. Well, all that potassium is just leached out because when you add fertilizer you don't simultaneously increase the soil's ability to hold it and um, it's it's nice now to have had so much research done that shows adding extra doesn't really provide a benefit not having enough is a problem so it, it all starts to make sense and i think mlsn works really good for a lot of grasses to to get us somewhere close to, to about the right amount that we would need to apply. And I do think your questions um, that you sent by the email, it got me thinking about it with the shorter root system on POA, the, the chance that it can die in the summer, the, the research that shows that sometimes POA responds to phosphorus but, or to potassium, but uh, bedgrass research like my my graduate school research, your graduate school research shows that bank grass doesn't respond to to potassium. Sometimes when we, we would have 10 years ago thought it would respond, and then we do the research and find out it doesn't respond. But they're still able to do some research that shows that low levels of soil K that, that POA annua sometimes can respond. So it it's, it's something I wanted to talk about with you because uh, I think we just need to be extra careful with poa annua and nutrients. And so um, 
what I would do is is think if, if you have a weak root system and if you're concerned about it, just flip over from MLSN and use something like the precision fertilization approach of STIRF. The precision fertilization approach is just looking at how much nutrient the grass can use based on nitrogen supply, which sets an upper limit on growth. And then you just meter that out, spoon feeding, like, like the ultimate in spoon feeding, because now you're applying N, P, K, calcium, magnesium, manganese, iron, copper, zinc, everything in doses, not to try to build the nutrient reserve in the soil, but just supplying it to meet the plant demand. And, and I, I don't think that I'd need to concern myself with that year round, but no. if, if I was concerned with POA annua and I didn't trust that the roots could take nutrients from the soil, I would just flip over to precision fertilization during the most stressful months. And, and I have no problem doing that because it turns out that nobody's giving big doses of nitrogen during those months either. So the, uh, the quantities of phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, manganese, that the grass can possibly use during those times is quite low. It's, it's negligible, it's tiny amounts. So uh, why would you not apply it if you're concerned that the grass can't get it? So I'm, I'm, I totally support that. And I think that like, that's gonna give you all the benefits that they see in the Rutgers research, um, I think, in, in terms of preventing, as long as your nitrogen rate is high enough, then you're gonna be supplying all the potassium the grass can use, all the phosphorus the grass can use, and you just assume that the grass can't get anything from the soil. You supply it all as fertilizer. And like I said, I think it's the ultimate spoon feeding approach. Yeah, I think I think that was great. And yeah, definitely. I just think if you're looking at creeping bent grass versus poa annua, in my opinion, I think, like you said, being very, you just got to be a little bit more careful on the poa annua, especially for now until, you know, maybe there will be some more uh fertility research trials on it in the future um but yeah i, I definitely agree where just be a little bit more careful uh now a question i had you know in terms of foliar feeding uh do you think that the leaf size of bent grass being a little bit bigger than poa has any um it plays any role in the fertilizer being able to get in the plant i have absolutely no idea Okay, because a superintendent noted it to me. He explained like a, a banner app for Baconazol, you know, kind of a hot application where if you hit it with a, a bent grass in the summer, you know, you have a higher risk of probably getting some tip burn or something because there's a wider leaf area um, that the spray is affecting than the POA where, you know, it's just, you know, POA and your very thin blades, a lot of plants. Um, I think in Huff's, I listened to a podcast with Dr. Huff, uh, the Penn State, uh, I believe it's called fresh cut grass. And he said, in terms of like plants per inch, I want to say Poa annua, he was, he sees them over 200 plants per square inch. And much of the, the pen cross is like 40 and a lot of the newer bent grasses are in like the 80, 90 range. So I just wonder if, if that could play a role in, in how we get from the recommendation to get in the fertilizer actually into the plant and especially during those stressful times. Yeah, I, I don't know, because I always think like foliar applications are going to be getting, uh, you know, if you have 100% humidity for a while around the leaves, then, so if the leaves stay wet, then maybe you're getting 20, 30, 40, 50, 60% uptake, and then the rest of it dries on the leaf, and then presumably you water that down into the canopy and it goes in through the roots. And I never really worry about the efficiency of the foliar application. I just don't want to burn it, right? I, I want to make sure I don't burn it. But so if, if we get some coming in through the leaves and some going in through the roots, then uh, I, 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 so I've never really thought like it would be more efficient or more effective on POA versus bank grass. 
but there could be something there. I just don't know. No, I think what you said is 100% where, yeah, you're not going to get all of it up through the plant, I think, on any turf grass. So a lot of it will end up going through the soil. Um, can, you, can you take a question from Joe? He's, he's asked um, in the chat, he said, have you, Ben, have you noticed green keepers applying more N, P, and K in response to the high amount of rounds we have seen over the past couple of years? Um, I definitely think some. I don't know about specific ones, but I think there, I've definitely heard and I've recommended for, you know, if guys are having a lot of traffic to maybe go out with some spot spray and especially on fairways. Um, and, you know, they're, I think they're typically probably using a, a mix of N, P, and K, obviously more N, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the Northeast, pretty much every one of my courses has hit record rounds at some time in the last two years. Um, so they've had to change a lot of things up of managing traffic areas, of divots, of you name it, uh, just with the increased play. Carl, Carl's Comenti has a comment about applying fertilizer daily. Um, Carl, if you find that particular paper, let us know. He he said he's trying to find work from Bowman that looked at nitrogen application frequency. As you became more frequent down to daily, the growth was more stable. So th that's something that I'll make a note of. And if I can find that or if you find that and share it with me, I'll put it in the uh, show description for the recording of this. And yeah, it, it's no surprise that daily is going to be more consistent. And um, in fact, I wrote that in the response to the email that you sent, yeah. Ben. And I, I said that uh, uh, it was in, uh, in response to the question about spoon feeding. And my answer was that theoretically, I, I think daily fertilization would be best, but it's not feasible. So in, in in that case, because it's not feasible, uh, spoon feeding as often as we can should be the next best option. So yeah, I have another question. You know, just when you see POA annual putting greens, especially in the Northeast, most of them are built on some sort of native push-up, uh, push-up green. You know, obviously amended with sand um where I, I think creeping bent grasses you see a lot more that were built on sand based root zone um so there's a lot of variability with between i would say poe annual greens across the northeast and across the world of of root zones where bent grass is you know probably more built on sands obviously some um poe annual putting greens are constructed on sands in certain areas uh in the northeast and some guys have done you know where they pulled the poa off, rebuilt the root zone, um, and then put the put the poa annual back down, back on. So I just, what role do you think, um, you know, the root zone uh, will play in that? Uh, if that kind of makes sense. Uh, I think grass grows better in soil than it does in sand, in general, and the only problem with soil is you have more of a compaction risk and sometimes you would have water logging or saturated conditions. But in general, I'm expecting grass to grow better in soil. The background image here, some of you may recognize that as the approach to the second hole at Waverly Country Club in Portland, Oregon, and with those nice trees in the background. Now you don't see the hole because you get to look at Ben and I, and I'm, um, I'm afraid if I try to remove my image i'm going to disconnect myself from the stream so i'm not going to try to get too fancy with that but uh waverly country club is um, uh, the place where i first started working in golf course maintenance and they have poa annual greens and i recall the 16th green is a downhill par three that goes down to the willamette river and was the one hole on the golf course that was sand based and then the other 17 holes in the practice greens were these old soil greens. And of course, the one sand grain with the uh, 
the turf just did not perform nearly as well. And so, I mean, I mean that's no surprise. Everybody who's managed turf sees that. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm, so I'm not sure exactly what your question is uh, about like what we would expect, but I mean, I would expect- I guess it would be more about- in soil. Yeah, oh, 100%, I would agree with that. But, um, you know, I don't know if it would be more of the recommendation or the actually implementing of a nutrient recommendation. Um, you know, I don't, it's, you can't talk about, I don't think POA, annual greens as a whole, because there's so many variabilities among root zone construction mixes. Um, but you can so do I a think, soil yeah. test and find out the, the nutrient differences. I, I, I think, I, I think maybe there's some people on the West Coast using MLSN maybe more than on the East Coast. I'm not really sure because um, not not every, I know there's lots of people using MLSN and there's a lot of companies around the world that are actually making MLSN recommendations. And I do soil testing for lots of places and, and make MLSN recommendations, but only with some of my really key clients do i know what they actually applied so making a recommendation by mlsn or um, doing a soil test interpretation by mlsn doesn't actually mean that people are following the guidelines they could be putting more than recommended or or calculated by mlsn they, and they could be they could be putting more they could be putting less um, so it's really hard to to know what's going on and how it works. But I, I'm pretty sure that the MLSN numbers are gonna work fine. I mean, if I would summarize the response, it would be, I think MLSN works fine for bentgrass and for POA. I am more concerned about POA than I am for bentgrass. With, with bentgrass, let's say I have almost no concern because I've also worked in Japan and I know how low the nutrient levels are in Japan. And as I mentioned, that's all bent grass and it's it's summertime weather like in between Atlanta and Jacksonville. So it's it's unpleasant for bent grass and it's just fine with MLSN levels or below in the soil. With POA, I just don't have a lot of experience um, recently because I work in a part of the world there where there's just not a lot of POA. But I talk with people like you. I talk with people like Eric. I, I, I'm from Oregon, which is a wonderful POA region. And I talk with Joe Galati. I talk with people that manage turf in uh, the Mid-Atlantic region. And I'm somewhat famil familiar with uh, the grass. And I am a little bit more concerned about it, but I still think it, it should work. Yeah, and, and I agree. You know, I'm not like I said. I wasn't coming on to kind of dispute MLS, and I think if I, I agree with everything that you said, where I think there's still a big enough baseline uh, or overestimate in there. Um, but yes, be just a little bit more careful uh, on Poe. I think you know, getting back to what you said about bentgrass being able to go very low, and obviously that was what my work did. And you know, my goal was like I tried to kill this grass as much as I could. We were triple cutting, we were rolling, we were doing this drought was, studies. Kind of my, this was my your bank grass. Work. Yeah. Bank Trying grass. to kill yep. the bank grass. Yeah, like I we were I was triple cutting every, almost every single day. Um rolling decreased height of cuts. We took out uh uh plugs and put them in the pots and moved them in the greenhouse and watched them dry down. Uh and you know despite the one green um it was it was our one of our sand greens it had the lowest p and k levels throughout the whole thing we going back to what i was saying earlier about doing the six pounds per thousand uh every week we were never able to really get those levels up above 40 50 parts per million so we were below the mlsn for most of it and phosphorus it was also a very low phosphorus green we were doing we ended up doing some some phosphorus fertilization trials on it after that um so the best performing green in terms of NDVI, uh, in terms of playability, we were doing ball roll, um, was that green that had the lowest phosphorus levels and the lowest potassium. Levels. 
but but if you were growing POA annual, we might reasonably expect that that would not be the case, and and maybe the POA would have suffered on on that green. Yeah, I mean, I don't one hundred. There was it wasn't pure bent, but I would say like we could have plucked the bent out of it or the POA out of it very easily. So. Um, yeah, I, I would think so, um, especially maybe in some of those dry down studies and, you know, some of the management studies, um, you know, pretty much, you know, we didn't look at a specific, okay, this amount of mowing causes this much stress. I just was trying to put the plots under as much stress as they could. So that's kind of where I did, you know, the easiest way to do that was to mow a lot. Um, and we even did kind of like a tournament preparation that led up to our field days where, I think I triple cut for three weeks straight. Um, and then I cut like eight times the final day and we got like 10 inches of rain that week. Um, but we, again, we didn't really see any, no negatives yet. Yeah. And we were, we were around 12 parts per million, I believe 12, 15 parts per million in our lowest K plots. Phosphorus was probably right around there. Um, so so it just kind of shows you bent grass, uh, is yeah, able to do this and we have a lot of work on that now yeah so yeah there's a lot of places uh, in fact i'm uh doug soldat has told me that i'm recommending too much potassium and i was just kind of shrugging it off uh when he told that told me before it's like okay he's right but i didn't really worry about it too much but then as i think about it, it's like i'm not really happy to be over applying systematically over applying when i don't have to and there's more and more research that keeps showing that it there's there's a lot of cases where the grass does do fine. And usually bent grass, it does fine with less potassium than the current MLSN. And so in addition to eventually updating the MLSN guidelines, which is going to bring the potassium number down by about uh, 20% or so, it'll be uh, closer to 30 parts per million. Right now it's closer to 40 parts per million. So one thing that's going to happen is when we do update MLSN, the number is going to go down. But I'm also trying to make some additional calculations by looking at how much nitrogen was applied, how much potassium was applied, and seeing how the soil test changed over time. From that, trying to tease out an estimate of, of uh, actual change in soil potassium compared to expected soil change and seeing if if one's higher or lower than expected and from that i think it might be possible to make a little bit more accurate potassium recommendations yeah i think i think that's like you said it's always changing uh which is good you know and that's one thing i definitely like about mlsn is um you know there's a lot of turf turf background data behind it uh when a lot of the other you know the other recommendations let's say you know most people don't really know where those numbers came from you you <laughs> mentioned the uh paper from beth gertol and uh one co-author i i disremember the name about the was it mcelroy uh, maybe it was maybe it was dr gertol and dr mcelroy uh I think that was it on on uh, poa annua and phosphorus, and they did this at, in yeah. Auburn. And in the materials and methods section of the paper, it, it describes what the phosphorus recommendations were, how that they were interpreted, and they said, "Yeah, we don't really have turf specific data, so we use some pasture, forage crop type of guidelines." And it's just like. Yeah, it's such a guess. It's just such a guess when you're pulling in numbers from other crops. And I think, I think when you get down to the nitty gritty of how soil testing is done in turf grass, MLSN is pretty good. It's pretty t- transparent. It's uh, it, it's based on all turf soils. It's based on professionally managed turf for the most part and it's based on good performing turf. So it's based on a lot of things that I'm really comfortable with. And you start looking at the alternatives and it's like, what is that based on? And you really, if you would try to find anybody supporting SLAN 
or anybody that could tell you where their regional SLAN numbers came from and then try to justify why they're still using it in 2022. That's not even talking about BCSR, but just SLAN. Like, uh, somebody tell me some good SLAN numbers somewhere that have like been properly calibrated. I, I, I don't think they exist. Not not for yeah. Tracks. I'm not I'm not too sure. I haven't you know done a major deep dive into it. But yeah, that's like you said for turf grass and you know in turf we have a different goal than any other agriculture crop where they're looking for yield you know we're looking to maintain a playing surface um so i think that's a big factor too you know where we're just looking to produce the best playing surface not necessarily the highest yield yep that's that's what we're trying to do which is why controlling the growth rate is so important and when you know the growth rate and you know what healthy grass has in it you can do the math and find out how many nutrients were in it and that makes the comment from Greg Austin um, is, is relevant to that because he said that he does that, he uses MLSN as the baseline, and then he adds more N if and when required, usually due to wear and recovery. But if your other nutrient levels are at the MLSN level or above, then just adding nitrogen should be able to allow the grass to get all of those nutrients that it needs. And so it's just, it's really a simple method of ensuring that the grass can be supplied with enough nutrients and leave it up to the turf manager to adjust the growth rate as needed. But and uh, then we get the quality that we want without trying to maximize yield. Yeah, I agree. And I think, uh, yeah, it's like you said, a very simple method that you know where the numbers are coming from. Um, and it's it's a tool, you know. I think one of the tools, one of the multiple tools that guys or superintendents are going to use to to determine what they're going to fertilize with. Like I said, you know, there's a lot of day to day factors um, and a lot more. Uh, so pretty similar to what I believe Greg said was, I think that's a good strategy to use MLSN as your base. And then, you know, if you feel that you have to apply more or do something, then you're going to do it. You know, it's your it's your golf course. It's your job you know it better than, than anyone else, so. I, I want to completely change the subject now. Okay. Because I think, I feel like we've been talking around this topic of uh, POA annua and MLSN a lot. There were a couple abstracts when you were a grad student and it looked like you were working on like sampling strategies for fairways um, yep. or just soil sampling strategies in general. But I never really saw a final report from that project. I just saw some abstracts. And I wonder, what was that project about? What's the status of that project? Um, because it's, it's something that I'm quite interested in, making more accurate fertilizer recommendations. So yeah, that was a, kind of a side project that I started working on with Max when I got there. Um, pretty much what we did was take uh, three different golf holes at a local golf course in, in State College called Mountain View. Um, and there was a flat fairway, there was a moderate sloping fairway, uh, and then there was a very steep sloping fairway. And we took about 100 samples on a grid with, I believe, eight or 10 foot centers um, to kind of determine, uh, you know, what the best sampling strategy would be for each of those specific sites. Uh, I don't 100% remember everything about it, but I do have a poster on it. In terms of uh, more than that, I'm not sure. Uh, the graduate student after me continued to look at it more because um, there was some data collected on similar sites, you know, from 20 years ago. So this could be something that could be a long term study that there might be some more coming out about, but I'm just not sure. Um, mm. But if, if I could look at just some of the conclusions that we wrote. Um, you know, the one would be with moderate to severely sloping fairways, sample elevation related indirectly to male three uh, extractable potassium and soil levels. Um, another one was despite having received identical cultural management inputs for 50 plus years, nutritional assessments of golf course soil is highly influenced by both structured and unstructured spatial variability. So meaning the slope. Um, and the one it's important to note the one fairway was was very was very uh, 
severely sloped. I actually had one of my good buddies as a surveyor and he came out and, um, you know, measured the gradients on everything. And, uh, if I could look here, the top of, uh, um, you know, from one side to the other, there was about a 20 foot elevation change on the steep slope and fairway. Um, and we're not talking, you know, we're probably, it's not like we're looking at some of the fairways now that are 50 yards wide. This is probably 25, 25 yards wide. Um, so our recommendations were pretty much when sampling a sloping fairway uh, in preparation for a single composite sample, sample up and down the elevation gradient. Uh, and when sam collecting multiple samples from a sloping fairway for a precision or var variable rate fertilizer application, sample along the elevation tiers. It's complicated. It's, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm interested in whether composite sampling or uh, single core sampling is, is able to give better recommendations. So, um, yeah, there, there was a really interesting article that shows that composite sampling will systematically overestimate the nutrient levels in soil and because of that, you might under recommend nutrients. And uh, so I've been thinking about this a lot um, because it yeah, turns out I haven't thought about. So and, and I keep I'm thinking over because it just never made sense to me. I'm like, how can how can taking a perfect composite sample not be the ideal way to do it? I'm like, how can how can just taking a single core from one location be theoretically better? than taking a really nice composite sample. And so I think about it and think about it and think about it. And it finally hit me that what we're trying to do with, with this type of soil nutrient analysis is make an accurate fertilizer recommendation. We're not trying to find the average so much. We're, we're not trying to identify the average potassium content of the fairway. That's not really the goal. The goal would be to make sure that we don't have a deficiency. So we're trying to um, make a, a more accurate fertilizer recommendation. So we'll, when we look at it that way, then I start simulating what the fertilizer applications would be based on different sampling methods. And it's still an ongoing project. And uh, maybe you can see in the background, um, there's some, some soil samples on the floor. Uh, it's an ongoing project. Um, some of the people on the chat, I think, know what I'm talking about because they've collected these samples for me. Um, and so we've done this in 13 golf courses around the world, looking at single core versus composite sampling. Now I'm doing some of the sampling myself. I was on three courses in Bangkok this morning doing that. And uh, it's, it's interesting. I'm not quite sure how the results will come out. Right now, it's just equivalent. But there's a lot of theoretical reasons where we should sample less to get more accurate recommendations, which I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around. But um, I keep thinking on it. If I think about it long enough, sometimes it, it makes sense. Yeah, I'm not, I, I haven't really thought about it that way. Um, you know, I think composite sampling is just the most simple uh, since most people aren't doing variable rate fertilizer applications. Um, but, you know, the best strategy might be to do more samples um, and then kind of look at what your low levels are so that you always prevent a deficiency. So, but if, if, if you did, want it, if you want to get your lows, you shouldn't, you shouldn't mix the samples because. Yeah, that's the, what I mean. Individual <clears throat> samples, find your lowest areas and then kind of base your recommendation off of that. Um, yep, you know, I don't know, but I think that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And so that's what I'm doing. And it, uh, and it turns out that it's a lot easier because instead of taking composite sampling, you just do one from a random location. But mm -hmm. of course you need more than one sample, but yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know it, what the right amount of samples would be, uh, to make sure, you know, what that number would be. Is it? You know, well, 10, that's 20, why I'm, you know, I don't know. That's why I'm doing I'm doing paired samples. So I'm doing the standard way and developing a fertilizer recommendation from that. 
and then I'm, I'm doing just a single sample and making a fertilizer recommendation from that so I can compare what the fertilizer recommendations are and check if I'm systematically over or under recommending fertilizer and also checking if there's any error. If, I, if, if I'm not taking enough samples, if I'm missing things that I would be getting if I do composite. So it's um, in, in today's blog post, if, if you're watching this live or, or listening to this uh, right after it's been published, you can still take a survey. There's a link to it on the AsianTurfGrass.com website where I've asked some questions about how people actually are collecting their soil samples. Um, I'm gonna run that survey for a couple of days and then I'll take the results and uh, post it. So if you're interested in this, and even if you're watching or listening to this many days or weeks or months in the future, you'll be able to find uh, a blog post where I summarize the results about this. Yeah, I think that's a really cool project. And just I'm looking at the poster a little bit here now, which I will send to you. Um, you yes, know, please. even on our flat fairway, you know, we had ranges of phosphorus that were 100 parts per million and then some that were 20 parts per million. Um, so that's a big difference. Right. So um, what what happens is if you if you composite the samples, now you don't know that you had the 20 parts per million spots anymore. Exactly. Because, yep. because your average goes to 70. And uh, just the concern is, by chance, you might only sample the 100 part per million spots and you also fail to capture your 20 part per million spots. So it's, it's, it's a, a fascinating one. I never really... Yeah, and I You'll see the on this poster when you know I, I share it with you, but you know Max was able to do this really cool data analysis of showing the spatial distribution of um, of the the levels, and I mean you can see they're kind of in zones. So, I mean, let's say you have a you know back to the Poe annual fairway for example. Let's say you have a a, a zone that's very low in phosphorus, um, and you're only composite sampling. You might never realize that. Uh, and all that all that area might need is just hey just go out there and hit that little area with some more more pee or you know especially you know but going back to where okay if we're only looking at the low uh, soil sample so in this case you know let's say we we took you know throw away the bottom or whatever and we keep 20 20 parts per million and then we blanket that across a whole fairway um, you know I I do think that's better because you're you're never you're going to eliminate the the chance of developing a deficiency from those high levels, but you will be putting a lot more fertilizer down than if you just did a composite sample. I, I think it's really interesting because we can do, we can make all of these calculations without ever having to apply the phosphorus. We can, we can just do simulation studies. Um, so yeah. it's, it's, it's quite interesting and something that it's certainly, um, it, it must be very simple for people that are that know how to do this. Um, but for me, it's it's like at the limit of what I know how to do, the limit of my mathematical prowess, the the limit of my understanding. So I enjoy it because I'm learning um, and, yeah. and keep trying to uh, figure it out and and uh, trying to share it and explain it and hopefully not get it completely wrong. <laughs> Yeah, um, but same thing with, you know, potassium on some of these, you know, we were looking at some in the flat fairway, even some zones that were in 30 parts per million and some that were 150. So and we're only talking 100 by 100 foot grid, uh, let alone, you know, if you're doing a couple composite samples for your whole course, it's a lot bigger grid, obviously. Um, I will tell you, this was not a fun project because there was an insane amount of soil sampling um, on not the best site, but I think we actually did get some really good data from it. Well, good. I, I've been looking mostly at, at greens, although we've done a little bit of this on fairways and roughs, but yeah, nothing this was fairways. I've, I've, um, so on, on greens, it just doesn't make sense to me to, to follow the recommendations of composite sampling because they're often constructed from a consistent material and even if they haven't been constructed from a consistent material they've 
definitely been treated consistently in terms of cultivation and top dressing and fertilizer. Yep. And so putting greens, they don't have a 20 foot. I can't think of any putting green that has a 20 foot uh, drop drop change in elevation from from the highest to the lowest point. So um, yeah, I, I think on putting greens, it it uh, it makes sense to just do single core. Certainly my results so far suggest that, but it it's uh, it's something that that uh, I wanted to chat with you about because I know you've done some of that work. So yeah, please send me that poster. I look forward to checking it out. I will. And yeah, I definitely, it did, makes a lot more sense, I would think, on, on putting greens just because that's what you're most worried about. And if, let's say we did see, you know, we had one green that had, you know, a, a, a 80 parts per million phosphorus range and a green that's 20 parts per million, um, you know, if we apply all if we make the fertilizer recommendation based off the low green it's not like we're adding a great deal of fer that much fertilizer it's not like we're the costs are that high compared to if you took that out to fairways where it would be like you know just with acreage the massive amount of of dollar increase and again the goal is to like in my opinion never have or come close to a deficiency um yeah me too i i get criticized for mlsn from from academic type people uh, for it being recommending too much. And, yeah. and, uh, and I don't I've think all, that's right criticism. I've, that's what, but I've always said that what we want to do is, is uh, we want to know where our error is. I never want to know that I might be under applying, I might be over applying, I don't know. That's, that's not what MLSN is. MLSN is, we're pretty close to the right amount, we think, but we're erring on the side of over applying. So it's always been designed to err on the side of, of applying a little bit too much. Now, maybe it's an unfortunate name that it's minimum levels, yeah. minimum levels, sustainable nutrition, MLSN. And people get the idea when they hear minimum and sustainable and stuff that it's like it's cutting, it's cutting, it's it's really low. But if you work through the math and you can, uh, you know, look at the MLS and cheat sheet to get an idea of the math or look at the little ebook I put together last year that explains or it, it put together all the MLS and newsletters, all this stuff's on my website. If anybody's interested, just go to the MLSN tab, which is um, an entire page on my website. So, um, if, if you do that and just look at how the math works, it, it shows that MLSN is always going to err on the side of a little bit too much fertilizer, but, but not, not too much. So I agree with you completely. The objective here is not to use the minimum amount of fertilizer. The objective is to achieve the desired results with no deficiency. And in the process of having no deficiency use the least amount of fertilizer that you can while preventing the deficiency completely so that's how it, yeah i think separating the the critical level versus what this is they're not the same um, which some people might just assume that when you say minimum um you know you're going to take it as close as you can to that critical level but in reality especially on bent grass you know poa I, there's still a lot of unknowns like we talked about but you're well over that that critical level with almost I mean any recommendation that I've that I've come across with bank grass with bank grass yep. with, yeah and and with POA I, I'm gonna say I think so but during times of the year when you think you have compromised root function or you think that you uh, have a limited root system I have no worries about switching to a precision fertilization approach, but doing anything beyond that and saying, let's apply three times more potassium than the grass could use, three times more phosphorus than the grass can use, let's try to build the soil level of calcium up, those kind of things. I think there's really zero uh, evidence and zero anecdote. There, there's zero logic that any of those would really be effective as far as I know. Now, maybe 
um, some somebody can contact me who who disagrees, or or you can tell me that there is anecdote or logic um, or research that shows that POA would respond to more nutrients than it can possibly use. Not that I know of, um, but I mean, it is a, a, a totally different grass than bent grass from us, you know, in, in multiple different ways. I wouldn't think, like you said, I would think MLSN still overestimates enough for that. And I think what you mentioned about yeah, use MLS, and this is kind of what I do, you know, use MLSN as a tool, you know, especially it gives you a good estimate, a good place to start. Um, but especially with POA, as you get into the summer and different uh, different areas, you know, it's just one of your tools and got to figure out the best way, given the conditions of that day, to, to, to fertilize your plants for the next week or so until you can get another app out there. <clears throat> John says, good evening from du Dubai. Hello, John. And we have another John asking about the sampling. Um, he's asking if Krieging could possibly lead to more accurate sampling results, thoughts. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that when you're doing the grid sampling that you would apply Krieging or a similar type of math to that wouldn't you i'm not sure what what that is actually yeah creaking is interesting i took a, a class on spatial statistics when i was in grad school and it turns out that it was uh to find like the highest probability of finding diamonds it, it was something mm -hmm. that was developed from the mining industry and so you've got a uh, um uh, it's been too long since I took that class, so I, I can't explain it. But it turns out to be pretty simple math um, to to interpolate. So if you know there's this much potassium here, and then you sample over here, you you sample in different locations. You know the distance between the locations. Mm -hmm. You can it will then tell you what it predicts the the potassium levels would be at unsampled areas. And so essentially when you're doing the grid sampling or the precision sampling, I, I don't know the terminology for it in soil sampling, but yes, Krieging, Krieging would be useful in that case. But to answer the question, he's saying, would it lead to more accurate sampling results? I think it would if you're using um, variable rate application. Uh, or if you're going to try to identify zones or sections of, of the turf grass area that would require an element or different rates of an element. Um, I, I'm still thinking about this in terms of we're going to apply the same rate everywhere. And so I'm just trying to make sure that all the deficient areas or potentially deficient areas would be getting enough. And then we're just going to slightly over apply in all the other areas and I I don't worry about it but if we sometime in the future that's going to be easier to do variable rate application and in that case yep. um, then you want to do something like creaking yeah to think that the, I don't think we're at the stage of the variable rate I couldn't even imagine devising a, a variable rate fertilizer plan for a whole golf course um, but yeah, yeah I, I just, you know, two topics, I think, you know, that we kind of discussed and they, you know, that might be worth mentioning is, you know, the pH differences between creeping bent grass and, and Poa annua. Um, you know, there's some work definitely showing that, uh, you know, a higher pH, I would think over six and a half for Poa and, and, uh, there's some benefits to being under that for creeping bent grass. Have you ever looked into that at all? Uh, no, I haven't looked into pH differences so much, but I just know that bent grass can grow good down to less than pH 5.5, and uh, the lower the pH gets, I think the more aggressive you would see the bent grass be in terms of competitiveness against Poa annua. Um, yeah, and I think that's interesting with, okay, so if you have creeping bent grass greens, 
we've seen, you know, really no benefits from P and K at, at really high levels. So, you know, I don't know if you could term it a cultural control of POA, but I would think managing a lower pH, lower phosphorus, lower potassium um, will at least give the bent grass a little bit of a competitive advantage. Yeah, it, it might not be enough to completely eliminate or prevent POA, but if I if I was managing bent grass and wanted to try to favor bent grass over POA, I would definitely be letting the pH drop low. So never applying lime. I mean, unless the bent grass was suffering, but that would have to be a really low. Very pH. low, very and low. I would be letting the P get really low. I would be letting the potassium get really low. And sometimes I don't understand why people are managing in a certain way because I see them managing bent grass and putting out all this fertilizer and calcium and stuff. I'm like, what? What are you? What are you doing? Because you're you're enabling the POA if there's seed there to get a foothold or if there's plants there, they can compete better when you supply it with that. So for me, I want to restrict it. But um, I, I think some people are doing that. But, mm -hmm. but I think that message still needs to get out there um, because like I know it, you know it, and there's lots of research that shows it quite clearly. But if we look at what turf grass managers do, they think that adding nutrients and adding lime and stuff can sometimes make it healthier for the grass, but it might be making it healthier for the wrong grass. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to grow bent grass, if, if you're, you're trying, trying to grow, grow poa, yeah. we baby it a little bit. So, yeah. um, but MLSN will still baby poa enough, I think. But yeah, I think it all depends, you know, you take that number and then you implement your strategy. Um, so you can determine how much you baby it uh, from how, you know, how you're choosing to apply your fertilizers to. Another cool thing about MLSN is because it's just a calculation based on good performing turf. So the MLSN number is chosen at the 10% level. So we we said 10% of the samples from good performing turf are lower than MLSN, and that's where we set the number. 90% of the, the soils from good performing turf are above MLSN. But there's a sustainability index calculator that is on my website, or you can go to the Shiny app section of the ATC website and you can find the link to this SI sustainability index calculator. So if you want to, if you're managing POA annual and, and you say, I, I like the idea of MLSN, but I'd rather keep my soil a little bit higher, you can go and you can adjust that to 20%, 30%, 40%, and you could find a different number. Or you want to be 50%. Let's say, let's say that you think it's stupid to try to deliberately get down to be in the bottom or like to be somewhere where 90% of turf grass soils are are above the level that your soils are. But you, you're really comfortable to be at the 50% level, where 50% of the soils are below, 50% of the soils are above. You can do that with the sustainability index calculator. And I think that's something that we we haven't really advertised so much, and we haven't really made that app so... Uh, readily available and pointed out those type of features that you can do but anybody can calculate a a number that they're comfortable with and still be apply uh, still be applying this mlsn concept which is still a modern method using turf grass specific data and you can say yeah i'm i'm poa in a stressful environment i think i want to be right in the middle I want, or maybe you want to be 70 percent it's it's still better than being at 100% because I yeah. don't think I I don't want to manage grass and saying I've got the the most nutrients in my soil in the world. But I don't think anybody wants to be at that level. So anything below yeah, that level, you can say that's 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 on the path to sustainability. <laughs> yeah, and if you're trying, if your goal is maybe not sustainability, but to put out you know firm, fast greens, 
um, being super high in all your nutritional levels could lead to more growth, which could hurt that. Is that correct? I, I would think so. So if, if you imagine if even if you're starving the grass from nitrogen, you're, you're, you're keeping your nitrogen rates really low and you've got a nice growth regulator program and but you're like, I, I like to keep my calcium and magnesium and potassium and phosphorus up just in case the grass needs it. Well, if the weather comes and you get uh, a bit of rain and you get uh, warm soil temperatures and you get a nice mineralization flush from soil organic matter, now all of a sudden with all that extra phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and magnesium there, you may get that growth flush that you don't want. and so then you would say, yeah, why was I keeping my nutrient levels so high? So I think it, it's something that would make sense. I think everybody probably wants to be in the bot in the, at 50% or below. And so you can, you can say you like 25%, you like 33%, you like 41%, whatever. You can find that number. Yeah, I think that's that sounds like a great tool. And I mean, I think it goes back to just kind of, you know, you're if you're a qualified, well-trained superintendent, you know, you're going to develop your own fertilization strategy for your own course. And that just gives them more options um, to have their their input, what they want on it. Yeah, I just encourage everybody to don't don't do things that don't have an effect and uh, mm -hmm. like there's some things like like gypsum or something that sometimes it has an effect, but in a lot of cases, gypsum is unnecessary. And so like people that are just like, who, what was I watching or listening to? Oh, Joe Galati's uh, Talking Greenkeeper part, podcast when he was talking with John Jacob and they were talking about the quantity of potassium that was applied. So this is a podcast they did uh, recently, and John and Joe were talking about um, one of the places where John had worked before, and they tried to put down, I think, 12 pounds of potassium per thousand square feet per year. And unless you're applying about 24 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year, and applying that 24 pounds of nitrogen really efficiently so that the grass can use it, um, and, and you're not leaching that some of that 24 pounds of nitrogen away. There's just no way in the world that the grass can ever use 12 pounds of potassium. And so he was religiously trying to put out 12 pounds of potassium. That kind of thing, I just, I mean, we can say like superintendents know how to get a good result. And of course they're getting a good result with that, but I'm pretty sure that they're, they're, not getting the good result from it, the extra potassium it just it happens it because it's not causing mm -hmm. harm and so i want everybody to get a good result and i want them to do it in the way that they like to do it and but i want them to just be somewhere in the ballpark with with applying reasonable rates because i think that not only is it the right thing to do but it makes the job easier because now you're not doing any wasted energy you're not you're not wasting effort not not wasting mental effort not wasting physical effort not wasting staff time and staff hours on doing anything that's not having a an effect so that's what i get really passionate about yeah and i agree and i think you know in terms of okay did the potassium make your greens perform the way that they did probably not it's you know, it, it's especially, you know, you, it's how you're watering, it's how you're, you're mowing and rolling to get the playability conditions that you want, you know, and they're coming up with all that on their own. I don't think, I think it would kind of be almost discredit to someone if it's like, oh, this product made, this is why my greens are so good. It's like, no, it's because everything that you're doing. And then, you know, I think primarily how you're watering and, and the other management uh, practices that you're putting them through. Yeah, it's 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 all about nitrogen rate when it comes to nutrition. It's it's about nitrogen rate and preventing deficiency with the other elements. So you can just put that on cruise control and then it's so important to do mowing, making the right decisions about mowing height, mowing frequency, 
irrigation, those kind of things are what really creates a good surface and not, not making mistakes. And so the nutrition yep. thing is, is something that you want to put on cruise control and, and not make mistakes there. So that's where MLSN has that safety margin built in. And I think we both agree that with Poe Annual, we might even uh, think that maybe if you want to do a little bit more safety margin, especially during the middle of summer, it can have some benefits. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think yeah, this was definitely very, um, very good discussion about about that. Uh, and now another question for the database that you pulled everything, would it be possible to separate out Poe annual putting greens? And would there be any point to doing that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not possible right now uh, for the global soil survey, I think we uh -huh. we do have the grass type, but that's a much smaller database. And for the future, I think this type of approach should include grass type. And yeah, the data I that agree. I the data that I collect personally right now that probably in the future is going into MLSN, uh, we collect grass type. But but the current MLSN doesn't have that. But I think. This is the type of thing. It's it's just uh, crazy that we don't have it, but we're developing it. Uh, yeah, it's in the process. It's in the process. So, so I think you know, kind of maybe be a little bit more careful with Poe annual now, and uh, you know, wait to come to see, you know, if you do ever get that data where we could actually see, maybe those numbers are a little bit higher. Who knows? Who knows? When we would speculate about it, we might think that they possibly could be. Um, possibly could be. But uh, yeah, we'll see. So John Smart asks, I'm interested in any work that's been done on bent grass greens with using only phosphite instead of phosphate. Would the bent grass survive and would that treatment keep the Paul annual at bay? Uh, I don't know. I think that's really interesting because uh, the phosphite, if you, uh, yeah, I think Beth Gertal and John Dempsey would have some answers about this because the phosphite initially is not plant available, but there's, there's research that I've read that suggests that it should be plant available in, so it gets whatever the reaction is that, that converts it into a plant available form that it can be used as a, as a nutrient. That happens in a few months. However, when I see soil test results for places that have gotten phosphite, phosphite, phosphite applications, I don't see that the soil P goes up. So, I don't really know, and I don't understand the chemistry of that enough to to know what would happen. Yeah, I don't. I'm not 100% sure. Um, yeah, I, I I don't have an answer for that one. I I think there's some potential there because uh, um, keeping keeping phosphate P low, keeping the the plant the the kind of pea that plants can use as fertilizer low is going to favor bent grass over poa. And it's just, uh, I think that if you just constantly apply phosphite, a lot of that gets converted into a plant available form over time, eventually. However, I haven't seen it, but that's what, what I understand should happen. Oh, okay. John said there was a link. I, I think I've heard that uh, YouTube somebody sometimes eats the links and it doesn't let them show. I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I'm not seeing a link here. Yeah, I, the, there's some comments about an 
Okay, an article by Pete Lanscoot. I, I will try to check that. I'm, I'm not able to see that article right now. Good stuff. I, I have these kind of uh, public live stream conversations and realize how much I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of questions out there. Yeah. I think especially with the POA anyway, like I said, so, um, you know, we didn't really touch on the biostimulant portion of the question. I don't, you know, we're almost two hours in. I don't know uh, yeah, if you want to go there. I think what you, the, the answer that you gave me was, um, was, was definitely pretty interesting. Um, so I don't know if you want to touch on that at all. And then, you know, that, that might be a, a good future episode for you to have some time with someone that has a lot of experience with biostimulants. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying, I, I gave a nice answer about why I think, you were asking if biostimulants might have a better effect, if certain biostimulants might have a better effect on POA annua than they would on creeping bank grass. And my answer was somehow, yes, they might, um, based on when I expect um, or under what conditions I expect us to see a result from POA uh, from f a positive effect from biostimulants. But I forget the exact details of my answer. So perhaps you can remind me. Um, I, I don't have the email pulled up, uh, but I believe it was at like a, you're explaining it where, you know, if POA annual was more stressed, uh, you did it in terms of percentages where, you know, a biostimulant might, uh, you know, improve you know, that stress from 65% or I'm sorry, turf quality from like a 65% to an 80%. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I remember that it was an innovative uh, spur of the moment answer that I think is pretty good. I'm going to do a blog post about that because I can't remember it well enough to explain it right now, but uh, I'll, I'll do yeah, a blog, I think, you know, blog post about There's that. a lot of different biostimulants out there and you know, I would, you know, kind of lean maybe towards some of the amino ones that some guys are using now. Um, but, you know, biostimulant such a big wide term that could be talking about a lot of different things just by saying the word, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know um, amino acid fertilizers are just kind of the standard way to fertilize bent grass in Japan, which, of course, I'm quite familiar with, but it's also a, a very... Um, stressful growing environment there because of the type of summer conditions that they have and uh do you see so i don't i don't really even think an amino that is, what's that do you see benefits from an amino fertilizer in that case then compared to uh you know a urea or an, another type of commonly used fertilizer um n not with my eyes not with my eyes and i don't really recommend it but I just know what people do. And mm -hmm. so they've done research that shows that you get various physiological benefits sometimes by using that type of fertilizer in certain types of heat stress situations. So I, but I'm always just care what kind of result I get. So I, I manage pancross in Japan and use urea and ammonium sulfate and the result was fine. It was good enough for me. So I never wanted to reach for the more complicated way of doing it. And that's the way that, and I, I still recommend that. And I've worked with lots of golf courses in Japan and I know that they're, um, some of them are using the fancy kind of products, but other ones are just using the basic ones and the basic ones work fine. So I always want to keep it as simple as possible. But with that said, if you do like to use biostimulants, it's likely that you can get the same result with slightly less nitrogen. And so, yeah, that's which where could, the, if you reduce your yield, you know, there could be some benefit there. Um, in terms of playing, you know, I could see more of a benefit maybe, you know, like you said, in Japan, where they're very, you know, very stressful growing conditions, um, going back, you know, mid Atlantic. We have some pretty stressful growing conditions for POA, especially. And, um, you know, if you're trying to put out, you know, super fast green, super firm greens and, and uh, reduce your growth as much as possible, 
um, maybe there could be some benefits there. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but I do have a lot of good feedback similar to you uh, from, from my customers, from some of those products. I, I, yeah, I think you just, you want to be really careful with cause and effect because the, um, if, if by using that product, you're also applying less nitrogen, then it's expected that you might get a amazing result. But um, I'll, I'll explain that in a blog post. Um, maybe yeah, I would suggest I so um, checking out uh, STMA. I watched it. Uh, a guy was on there, I believe Dr. Hopkins from um, BYU. He's done a bunch of uh, of uh, biostimulant work and you know he kind of talks about the differences in when there's stress and when there's not stress and and just a lot of the confusion in there um yeah, so that might be some, worth checking out for you yeah he's got some great articles about that i've, I've never yeah. seen any of his presentations but i've read in fact the uh the article on my website or the blog post on, the post on my website that gets the overall the most views is called is carbon the next frontier in fertilization and all it is is an article that takes quotes from an article written by dr hopkins and another hopkins who i i wonder if it's related to him but it's brian hopkins it's it's an article by hopkins and hopkins and interesting and they conclusively say that the answer is no carbon is not the next frontier in fertilization and they explain why um, and so my blog post just takes quotes from that article, which is is a terrific article. And he's got other articles about biostimulants where he's he's tested, um, I think, over a hundred studies, and you know he's gotten positive results in in a few selected cases, but in many cases, yeah. And no, that, he he no touched results. on that, and and that's what he said. Yep, yeah, primarily no results, but he did say you know he was on Kentucky bluegrass. So we're not necessarily talking, you know, super stressed out putting greens. Um, and he, you know, specifically said, hey, I didn't try to manage these under stressful conditions, um, which I think if you are doing research on biostimulants, you should be looking to put out as much stress as you can on them. Um, just my opinion. Yeah, I think so. I think the cases where you can see. Um, I think there's cases where you can expect that there might be a positive result from biostimulants. And uh, if, if that's how you'd like to manage, then then please avail yourself of those types of products to to get every chance you have of of obtaining those benefits. So, yeah, yeah I think it goes back to what the what the superintendent wants to do, you know, what he sees the best results from um, to kind of hit the common goal. Exactly. Yeah, we we keep coming back to that same thing, which is uh, which is correct. So let's check the chat one more time. Uh, I think John and John are um, answering each other's questions, which is wonderful. Good. So I'm I can't believe we've gone to two hours again on this, um, and. I, I appreciate everybody that stayed with us to watch this or to listen to this. And um, this is going to be recorded, so it'll be available as a video. And I'll release it as an Office Hours podcast. So some people will listen to this in the sometime in the future, I, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, I've made a few notes about things that I'm going to put in the, in the description, something about the SUSFOS project in Scandinavia, um, the definitely about biostimulants. I'm going to do a blog post about biostimulants. So, um, yeah, I think yeah. that would be great because that's obviously a lot of unknowns. They're pretty widely used. There, there's a million products out there, and and they, they're uh, very well sold. Put it that way. Um, so I think uh, the more that we can learn about them, uh, the better that the better that will be over time. I think I can just um, I I can link to some of Dr. Hopkins' articles, <laughs> and uh, yeah. I'll look up his his article for, or his. I think Dr. Fidanza has a pretty good one too. Um, I'll try to find that for you. Good. Thank you.
Yeah, please, if you have time, do a follow up with me. With with uh, and you're going to send me that poster too. Yep. Jason Haynes has a new comment. Which, yeah, so, you know, I'm not a golf course superintendent. He is, so he has a, a very practical view. And I am not he, either. Let's, let's state that. Yeah. I think that's always so, important to state. <laughs> yeah, so he says, an underrated factor is that sometimes you have so much that you are worried about, so a slight over-application of fertilizer can help reduce the superintendent's stress. And I think... Um, I'm going to say applying a biostimulant can help to reduce the stress too. And I talked to some of my superintendent friends and I'm like, what are you doing? Like you're, you're applying like this particular product in every spray. Like, what are you trying to accomplish? And they just like, yeah, why not? Uh, where it's easy for me to say it's unlikely uh, to have an effect. And I've, let's say I've studied it, I'm pretty sure it's not having an effect, why don't you just cut it out? But when your job's on the line uh, and, and you think it might be having an effect, then uh, I think superintendents tend to apply. When I was a golf course superintendent, I applied a lot of things and especially potassium. Like if I could apply potassium nitrate, I was putting it out, which is way more potassium than you would ever need. But I was applying potassium nitrate, potassium sulfate, then go back to potassium nitrate. And so I, I'll ask you one question before we close. I was surprised when I did my PhD research after having been a golf course superintendent. And uh, then I went and did my PhD research. I was surprised that we got no response to potassium. I, I, that's not what I expected. I thought we'd get a beneficial response to added potassium and so I was doing a lot of research about that, and all we found was no effect. And, and I was expecting to get some positive response at, at one of those low to intermediate rates. For your research, were you expecting to get a response from the potassium? And then when you did that mowing it eight times a day in tournament conditions, simulated tournament conditions for three weeks, drying it down, were you surprised that potassium had no effect? Oh, yeah, very surprised. I mean, I obviously did the whole literature review and stuff and saw that there wasn't much, but just being me, you know, I thought I was going to be the guy that would be able to put it under enough stress to see the response. Um, so, yeah, I was definitely, definitely, definitely surprised. And, you know, just to touch on Jason's comment, I think that's 100% true. Like, you guys have so many things that are going on as a superintendent. This is just one small part of it. Um, anything that can help you you know, sleep better at night, anything that can help you, uh, you know, do your job better. Um, you know, if, if you don't have to worry about it, I think that, you know, in, if the goal is to make the the course the best it is, um, even if a fertilizer has no effect, let's say, um, but it helps you as a superintendent and your crew um, not have to worry about things and focus on other things. And that's, a, that's an overall benefit, um, in my opinion. So, and yeah, we can sit up here and, you know, recommend stuff and talk, you know, it's, well, I like to say, I don't do too many recommendations. I like to just say, Hey, here's the information, take it and then come up with your own um, idea of it and make the decision. Uh, Cause you know, you guys know your property the best and you guys are the guys with the gun to your head um, to produce the best conditions. So yeah, even if, a, even if let's say you do a K app cause your loyal levels were, you know, teetering down to a lower level, um, if that's going to help you uh, not have to worry about that, which I, I would say it does, and that leads to, um, you know, you able to do other stuff on the course or just have a better mental mindset, uh, then that's an overall benefit from the fertilizer application, even if it didn't necessarily benefit the turf. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But I, of course, I would still encourage everybody to optimize. So yeah, I, oh, I understand yeah. it has a benefit. I understand it happens. And I understand that if, um, if I was in, in those shoes, I might be make, I would likely be making those same choices. And, and in a lot of areas, I'd probably be making worse choices than superintendents would. Mm -hmm. But in my particular role of uh, studying turf, turf grass nutrition, I'm, 
opinionated about trying to optimize as much as possible. And so if I see people systematically over applying or systematically under applying, like it drives me crazy when I see people that like have a phosphorus deficiency and just ignore it. And I'm not talking about the bent versus POA, I'm talking about like Bermuda grass. So if you're in a tropical climate growing Bermuda grass, it can use a lot of nutrients because it's it's growing year round and it has high temperature. And like you have a phosphorus deficiency, fix it. And and I I uh, I'm maybe I'm changing the subject, but whether it's over application or under application, like if if you're missing, if you've got a deficiency and you don't deal with it, or if you're um, if you don't have a deficiency and you continuously over apply. I just want people to continue to try to optimize, but yeah. And I think that's key and learn more over time. And I mean, as that, let's say, put someone in that example as they would learn more, listen to more discussions and talk, uh, then I think that they're going to get to that point eventually. Yep. That's so that's why I try to write about it on my blog and I keep trying to think of better ways to explain it and that's why when you write with such good questions, and I know you're thinking about these things quite deeply and, and mm -hmm. um, talking with golf course superintendents who are thinking of, you know, living this on a day to day basis and thinking about it quite deeply and, and doing the work and then observing the results. Uh, I was so glad to have you on the office hours today so that we could talk about it. And I hope that this show will, uh, that I can do a few of these episodes uh, and it's not on any kind of fixed ske fixed schedule, but to be able to do this and talk with people like you or with turfgrass managers or other scientists, people in the turfgrass industry who have interesting things to talk about on these issues and we can all learn together and, and uh, spread good information. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. And yeah, I think that's the key is just learning learning more as stuff as stuff evolves you know as we learn more about poa uh it's only going to make everyone better okay i see martin has a question about a sensor i just don't see the links on on my screen and i'm not sure if they're showing up on youtube um but i'll, I'll check that later but uh you guys in the chat can can figure that out but if there's no more if there's no more questions, it's getting late in Bangkok, and I know you guys uh, in other parts of the world probably have uh, work to do or yep. meals to eat or something like that. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm so glad we could have this discussion. I look forward to reading that poster about the sampling and uh, hopefully meeting in person sometime. Yeah, definitely. Come to the Northeast and give some talks. I would, I would like to. I would, I would, I would like to uh, visit, go see some of those nice POA courses. Yeah, definitely. All right. Yeah, dinner time for Martin. Okay. Well, uh, I appreciate everybody for listening to us talk. And we'll be back with another office hour sometime. In, in the meantime, uh, keep reading my blog if, if you like that. And uh, I'll, I'll write about some follow up to this and, and the sampling topic that we were talking about. I'm also going to be doing a blog post about that. So thanks, everyone. OK. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and stop the stream. So thank you, Ben. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks.